when we do accumulate this grief, you know, when we do, we kind of see the, the tiger smile is what the Vietnam vet said, you know, you know, have you seen the tiger smile? My name is Roger Sparks. I'm a veteran. I served 12 years in the Marine Corps and just about 13 years as a pararescueman. I mean, I grew up, I was just kind of like this not underprivileged kid. I had a great childhood, but uh, I didn't have a lot of options. And so going in the military was a way to get out of the small town that I grew up in. All of my male role models when growing up were Vietnam vets. One of my dad's dear friends was a corpsman in a Marine infantry platoon uh, in Vietnam, and, and uh, he would tell me stories, and he was this very eccentric, larger-than-life character, and it really just had this effect on me because I would just almost romanticize the things that they had experienced. And of course, some of the things that they had experienced were pretty horrible, you know, and, and my intentions of going into the Marine Corps infantry with hopes of becoming a reconnaissance Marine were directly from those experiences of the men that I grew up around. It was just a very intentional thing that I wanted to learn about life, you know. Um, I wanted to kind of see what I was made of and see really what combat was about. So it was a very naive self, but I think that I'm better for it, you know, even though I feel very lucky to be alive for my experiences. I had some very defining moments as a pararescueman. In 2010, I was the NCOIC of a detachment of pararescuemen in Afghanistan. We were basically there to provide CSAR for the larger aspect of the entire OEF. We were stationed out of Bagram, but we would go to different areas and there was an operation going on called Bulldog Bite to Charlie. It was an army operation where the 101st Airborne were raiding insurgent training camps uh, in the Waterpur Valley. And that's very, very, very uh, high northeastern Afghanistan up in the mountains very steep, steep terrain, almost fifth-class terrain. You're trying to fight with crew-served weapons, mortars and artillery support, Apache gunship support in this environment. It's very difficult, to say the least. We were just stationed, like, on the very edge of the periphery of the firefight that was taking place, because to save lives when guys are getting shot with 50 cows, you have to get on them immediately and get them to cold steel and bright lights is what we call it. You know, you have to get them to a surgical team because I can keep you alive with you being dismembered for about 30 minutes, you know. With blood products, tourniquets, and different drugs, I can keep you alive. But beyond that, you have to get to fucking surgery. Basically, they sent in uh, a couple hundred guys with CH-47s on the top of these mountains, and this is like 7,000 feet elevation and they were gonna drop them at the top of these things and basically move down the mountainside and move to contact, like reconnaissance by fire, and go through these training camps and look for a fight. And they definitely found a fight. Throughout my entire career, I mean, like I said, I spent 25 years in special operations. And, and uh, the surreal nature of the combat that took place during that week, I'm just haunted with. Like, I can't, I can't articulate it correctly. I think the first day, I think there was like six or seven KIA on our side. And uh, like every two or three hours over an eight day period, we'd get called to go recover, uh, killed in action, as well as guys getting overrun by enemy. And we just hoist right into the middle of it in an attempt to sort it out. Our radios work, you know, 10 miles or so with the frequencies that we were using and the terrain that we were in. And, because of this, I could hear everything that was going on on the ground. Like they're talking in brevity codes and you can tell that they're absolutely beside themselves with horror. They're getting fucking mutilated. And, and you can tell that because of the tone of their voices at the same time, uh, the voice changed two or three times, which meant the guy that was talking on the radio was either killed or had been shot or incapacitated. You know, you're just like, fuck, you know, like we're going, you know. The British SAS coined a, a term that's called uh, he who dares wins. And so imagine you just have these fucking stony pipe hitting fucking killers in a room and they're all doing cocaine and they've got loaded automatic weapons sitting there. 
And if you walk up to that fucking door and you're like, I want to kill every one of you motherfuckers, and you walk in there and you just kick the fucking door in and start shooting people, that has power. So if you fly a helicopter right into the middle of, you know, getting overrun, there's audacity to that. And, and that's what our technique is. <laughs> just come barreling the fuck in and just guns fucking blazing and hoist us right into the middle of the gangbang. And uh, that, that was our plan, is just to kill the guys that are killing you and we're gonna fucking try to save your fucking life, that's it. As the helicopter slows down, we're already hoisting down to the ground and the cable that we hoist in on is a quarter inch thick. And I mean, that thing got hit six times with crew serve machine gun fire as we hoisted into that. The whole time I was like, I truly believed that every three seconds that we were gonna die. And the fact that we weren't dead every three seconds was just kind of miraculous. And as soon as my foot touched the ground, an RPG detonated 20 feet from us. Those things rock you to your soul. You know, I mean, that affects your DNA. Immediately the machine guns open up on the pavehawk that's above us and they're shooting 50 cal incendiary explosive and armor piercing rounds from it, you know, and it's raining 50 cal casings coming down on top of me and they're hitting you in the face and stuff. And I remember distinctively feeling pleasure at the sake of other people dying. So I was like, you're trying to fucking kill me and I know these guys in this helicopter are fucking killing you right now. I, was, I just felt powerful at projecting death. When you're in that position, it's nothing but just dirt and rock getting tossed up and it's just kind of chaotic. Th at this point, we are literally being overrun. The platoon sergeant directed us to where the casualties were. We're trying to make our way to them. They were maybe another 100 or 200 yards away from us. And we called in four Hellfire missiles well within danger close. I mean, well, well within danger close, you know, to the point to where when they released the Hellfires, they were just coming straight at us, you know, on the hill. And you could hear the servos of the, the missile being directed at us. And so at the last minute, it just goes right past us and impacts just over the hill. And uh, if that will make you shit your pants, man, nothing fucking will, man. An F-18 checked in. Uh, sometimes they have like machine guns that they can fire for us. They didn't have any of that, but they had a 2,000 pound dumb bomb. We dropped a 2,000 pound bomb danger close to us. And we, we, were, we were literally martyring ourselves. Like there's no way you should live through that. I immediately just out of just animalistic rage ran towards where the casualties were. I come over the hill and there's an enemy that's just fucking shell-shocked. Like he had just received the percussive blast of that 2,000 pound shockwave. And I mean, that's like fucking CSF running out of your fucking ears, your eyes fucking bleeding and stuff. And there's still debris raining from that blast. And I ran and I hit him face, just boom, I ran right into him as I jumped and sprint over that hill. That's how close those fucking dudes were to us when we dropped the 2,000 pound bomb. I just kept sprinting towards where the casualties were because I knew we only had, I didn't know how far I was going to run. I didn't know how far the casualties were, but I wanted to get to him as quick as I could. The earth is chewed the fuck up, man. All you can smell is cordite from high explosives and earth. And the first guy I got to, uh, to understand the forces that, that this guy was dealing, that his body fucking dealt with. His legs were turned around backwards. His armor was ripped off of his body. His helmet was ripped off his body. His chin's partially detached. And he's just laying there breathing. Just <laughs> when you get within arm's distance of a casualty like that, they immediately grab you and they fucking pull you into them. And it's a very horrible fucking thing because it's like you were fucking drowning them. Like if you took a motherfucker and held them in a fucking toilet, like stuck their fucking head in the toilet, they're gonna fight. And because they're dying of anxiety and lack of oxygen, you literally have to fucking beat them off of you and fight them as you're trying to treat them. And it was just fucking horrible. And it took me about five to 10 seconds to realize that I had to start treating the guy. As I'm looking at his chest cavity, he had a hole the size of a fucking fist in the side of his chest. I mean, we are trained to treat that, but that's pretty fucking severe. I basically took a hyphen dressing and stuck it inside his chest cavity. That's all I could do. Uh, I decompressed his chest really quick with a giant fucking needle. And then I'm like, okay, I'm done with you next. And so this is just mass casualty. So it's like treat everyone with the injuries. And so there was a guy laying on his back talking to me. 
asking me to help his friends. And I went over to him and I held him in my arms. I don't know why, but I kind of held him like I held him like a child. And, and as I did so, my hand went in the back of his head. And uh, when I did that, it really, really fucked me up because I just had one guy die on me. And my job is to save lives. And so when people die in your fucking arms, it really messes you up because I don't care how you want to rationalize it, you're implicated in their death. My job is to save your life. And when you die looking me in the fucking eyes and I'm trying to save your life, I'm involved in that in some fucking way. You know, and so I started amassing the killed, you know, we call, we call them heroes, you know, I think we had three or four heroes at the time, maybe six, I don't even fucking know. And I, I was piling them up where my partner was and uh, creating human shields of the patients that were alive. So like the guy with his arm blown off, like I would throw a dead body on top of him to shield him. And, I, and you know, you're, you're doing this just reflectively. There's NVGs, there's radios, there's rucksacks blown the fuck up. Uh, and you're trying to get all that and you're just throwing them down the mountain to try to get them in one pile, you know. If we hadn't hoisted into that, everybody would have been fucking killed. My partner and I were on the ground for two and a half, three hours with those guys. Like I said, we were overrun and it went to hand-to-hand -hand fighting. You know, when guys die in combat, you know, like, it's, it's pretty fucking horrible, but you know, when you feel like you let them down, it's really fucking bad. But that, that night, four guys died in my arms and, uh, but I was able to save uh, four. And uh, we definitely didn't think we were gonna live through that. Uh, we only had one helicopter left because they were so like fucked up. And so uh, we hoisted up, I think we had five killed in action in the helicopter, four PJs and an a and interpreter with his leg blown off all in the back of a pave hawk. And uh, I was the last guy to get hoisted. And so I didn't have anywhere else to sit but on top of the dead bodies. You know, it was four, you know, four dead Americans just fucking mutilated, dismembered. And we have to pull them out of the fucking helicopter and try to figure out what fucking shit goes in what body bag. We were trying to do it with discretion because they're fucking buddies. Like their buddies are watching us, man. You know? I laid on my back and I started crying. And then we got an immediate call to go back out. I said to myself, I'm like, this is where the problems begin. Like this is fucked up. This is where it happens. This is where we kind of see the, the tiger smile is what the Vietnam vet said, you know, you know, have you seen the tiger smile? Because I'm not being allowed to process this. I see a picture of my wife and kids and I just go fetal on the floor, man. It was just so overwhelming to try to come home to myself a little bit. And in hindsight, what we had lost and what I had lost is my humanity. Like I've lost my fucking sense of even who I was. Now, Carl, Carl Jung, this famous 60s philosopher, he says, synchronicity happens when you have unprocessed events. We land within two to three hours, these guys are at our fucking doorstep. And they're like, uh, we wanna uh, uh, film you guys and tattoo you and make a documentary about it. And it was like, what the fuck? And I'm like, okay, shake it off. I'm like, at least they'll, they'll make a movie and document this shit because I don't even know how I'm alive now and I want my wife and kids to at least see something real. The three people were three gentlemen. One guy's name was Casey Neistat. The other gentleman's name was David Kuhn. The other guy's name was Scott Campbell. Scott Campbell's a very talented tattoo artist. David Kuhn is like an international lawyer. And Casey Neistat uh, at the time was just a very a quirky and very interesting movie producer. The naivety or the naiveness of their project, because it sounds really interesting to make a documentary about guys that just experienced surreal combat and tattoo them, but the reality of that is a very grief-stricken human being that is attempting to assimilate his experiences. 
But I don't think that there was a more cathartic experience that could be produced or fabricated that was as cathartic as them tattooing us is directly after that. And the first tattoo I did was about a year after those events that took place, and I ended up tattooing my legs. I was really hanging it out there. I really bit off more than I could chew to be this fledgling tattooer with shitty tattoo equipment and attempt to do this with myself. And I'm like, I'm gonna attempt to master this medium. I'm gonna fucking do this. And so that was almost eight years ago, seven, eight years ago. And I've just been obsessed with it. And so in my pain, it, it also was my way forward. And it allowed me to change as a human being and attempt to articulate my story. The really insidious nature of the aftermath of combat is you really isolate yourself from the ones that you love. You distance yourself from your wife, your children, because you don't feel like you can identify with them and you don't want them to be concerned about you. You don't want them to realize that I'm waking up with fucking nightmares about people dying in my fucking arms. And it's like, you don't want them to have to fucking deal with that. The minute that you stop rebelling against that and you embrace it is how you start sailing home to yourself. There's something very powerful about telling our stories. You know, which you guys, that's, that's this fucking project is telling our fucking story. That is catharsis because it helps us come back to ourselves. It gives us perspectives of what does my fucking story even mean? All this horrific shit that I've been talking about, what value does it fucking have? Because me and my fucking dark dungeon ass garage, it means fucking nothing. But if the rest of the world can understand that, it closes the narrative of what a combat veteran is because we're fucking lost. There's no place, there's no meaningful articulation of our stories. People want to talk about courage. That's fucking courage. We can derive whatever meaning we have from our lives through that. But you have to allow, you have to be a willing participant in that. And that takes courage, it takes risk to do that, you know.